I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. Today we have a fun episode. I'm joined by Taika Waititi, who is Hello. the director and one of the stars of the film Boy. Yeah. Um, we're going to get there in a minute, but I wanted to start uh, because your filmography is kind of an interesting and fascinating thing. One of the first things that popped out to me is that you're an Academy Award winner. You won an Academy Award for a short film. Well, I actually didn't win. I was only nominated. Okay. Same nominated. thing. Same thing. So, I, was, I was blown away. I was like, like, that's a huge like place to start off from. And that was Two Cars, One Night. Yeah, that was my first, first short film. And yeah. That's a pretty prolific place to start off to be nominated for an Academy Award with your sh first short film. What was that experience like, you know, just making the film and then getting nominated for an Academy Award from it and then having to realize that you've been nominated for an Academy Award and basically the only place to go from there is to win it, I guess. Well, um, yeah, well, I mean, you can imagine, like, you know, the after the disappointment of not winning an Academy Award, just you know the things like uh, alcoholism and drug problems start up, and <laughs> Seems like that's when you, you've seen Boogie Nights, right? You've seen the yeah, decline that, that, of. So that's of, your story, yeah, essentially. Basically, yeah. So then it was all downhill from there. I mean, you start at the top. <laughs> There's only one place to go. So uh, no, I, I'd never really, I never really, really. Man, this seat's crazy. I never really uh, was going to be a filmmaker. I was uh, before that. Um, my background is visual art and acting and comedy and I'd done a lot of other things and then I sort of wanted to give filmmaking a go made the short film it did amazingly well and then because uh, I, I didn't really have like a proper job at the time everyone said oh you should do that for a job because you know, it's obviously like you've got some success there and so I did I just decided yeah that okay I'll make this my job and then I did another couple of short films then my next short film accident actually not accidentally, but like actually, um, <laughs> that was uh, on the shortlist for the Oscars. That made the final ten, but um, the more failure there, it didn't get nominated, and so well, it's, I mean, hence like another decline. It's, it's, down it's kind of amazing, though. Like if you think about it, in some ways, you're like you know a young guy from New Zealand just making a short film. How do you even get the attention of the Academy? Like I don't even know. Like if I were in your shoes, that I'd ever be thinking about trying to get into the Academy Awards, let alone getting well, the Well, it's definitely not the it. reason people should be making films, let alone short no, films. Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I made the short because I really liked the story and I, you know, I just wanted to make a film. And then once it was done, I thought, awesome, I've accomplished something. So, uh, you know, and then, and then it, it started doing a lot of festivals and for the Academy to notice things, um, you know, shorts have to win either a certain number of festivals or at, like, the specific, like, Academy... Um, uh, approved, approved yeah. ones, yeah, and they and and it won a lot of them. It won a lot of festivals, just dominating all those festivals from dominating, <laughs> killing people. With which, my film. which is a pretty awesome place to start. So you know that 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 leaves a high bar to move on. But one of the things that was sort of fascinating to me is like when I think New Zealand, I'm sure you get this all the time. The first thing that most people are conscious of is the Lord of the Rings. Like that was the sort of New Zealand that many people knew for many years, and in the mid aughts, if you want to call it that, there came this sort of quirky comedy style that came out of there, most notably known for The Flight of the Concords. but you were actually a very instrumental part in that. You directed and wrote uh, Shark vs. Eagle, which is sort of like the, I guess, precursor to the TV show version of Flight of the Concords, at least. Um, was that always something you had wanted to do? Had you met those guys and sort of cultivated that style with them? Is that sort of what you like to do naturally? Well, yeah, I mean, we all met at university, so we uh, have all known each other since, I think I met Jermaine when I was about 19. Wow. And then, uh, so we start actually met doing some, like, comedy shows, and then we started working together more and, like, writing more, more shows and, like, all, like, sketch shows and uh, plays and, you know, and, 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 yeah, just sort of all collaborating. It wasn't just us three it was like you know there's a lot of other people there as well um who we also you know try and work with often and um yeah and then it just sort of went from there and then you know, i started making film and the, and those guys by then were doing really well with concords and then 
yeah, and I'm sure it's like any other small small community of people who are doing the same stuff. You know, you always like work on each other's things, and you know. So then they asked if I wanted to do some work on Concord, so I came and yeah, like, you, wrote you worked on the TV show. Uh, I mean, directed a handful of episodes, wrote on a handful of episodes. I mean, you might not have been the face of like the New Zealand comedy change or mm. whatever, but you were equally instrumental in sort of putting that out there. I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for me, I think like you know, <laughs> nobody like to, in New Zealand, like even Peter Jackson, Peter Jackson wouldn't even be where he is today if it wasn't for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, it's really kind of cool just because you know we're from a pretty like like non-eventful like place you know not, not a lot happens in new zealand it's like i mean it's a nice beautiful place and i love it remote. but it's it's yeah i mean if you're into waterfalls and um flowers and stuff well, th- it's a think, beautiful it's a great place to go i think the lord of the rings definitely probably like quadrupled the tourism in- probably yeah yeah and um but yeah so like you know to to be able to just work on anything really and you know to and to keep getting all these opportunities to do stuff and you know to work with my friends on other stuff is it's really great and that that one's a sort of an interesting one because it's a film i mean the concourse tv series was a show i mean you had worked sort of in the realm of film what was that transition like in terms of going to tv was that was that a dramatic change because you know the the pacing was much more intense and in trying to get stuff done like what was that experience like for you as a director um it was actually fine because I was working with those guys. Yeah, I was working with my friends, so it was really like it was like a lot of fun. Like, I mean, I think we just I don't know. I I found that really easy to do that transition. You know, like obviously there were some times when it was difficult because of the time. You know, it's like you know, you've got to cram things into a small amount of time, and you know, and sometimes you'd be rushed for to do some of the music videos. But for the most part, it was yeah, because like a lot of the. I don't know a lot of that style of like the talking and stuff plays out by itself quite easily. So um, yeah, I don't know. I found that the whole experience was probably the best TV experience I've had, um, especially because HBO like are so hands off mm. when it comes to sh- to making that stuff. Yeah, they just kind of turned up and hung out, and like half the time I didn't even know who was like working for HBO on set, and I was like, where are they? Where are these execs everyone's talking about? Um, awesome. Yeah, they, they were amazing and. Uh, yeah. Which brings us to now, sort of, I mean, I guess two years ago with Boy. Uh, Boy is sort of a step back into the indie world uh, in terms of filmmaking at that point. I mean, you know, yeah. Shark vs. Eagle had gotten attention and been acquired, I forget by whom. Uh, uh, Miramax, yeah. Miramax. So, that, I mean, that's a pretty significant event if Miramax is buying your films. But this is this is much more sort of an indie film in its truest sense of the roots. What was sort of the reason why you decided to do that i mean it probably would have been very easy for you to continue on doing projects at hbo or something like that why did you decide to go back and do something in new zealand no less well i I really feel like this is more like my first film so you know i wrote this thing it was the first script i wrote and um so i wrote this and then i put it aside to go and make eagle versus shark and then came back to it like having learned how to make a feature, came back to this screenplay and thought, okay, now I know what to do with this, and I want because I, it, I always wanted to make a film about that area of New Zealand. That's where I grew up, and uh, so like you know, it's a very like. Well, that, that was definitely one of the things I was thinking about while yeah. watching this was because it's like, okay, you have Lord of the Rings, which is obviously, I mean, it's set in New Zealand, but that's it's where not Peter grew up. <laughs> uh, you have uh, you know, Flight of the Concord, which sort of portrays New Zealand people, but it's not actually New Zealand. And I was like. Okay, I feel like this is the first time I've sort of really gotten experience of what New Zealand actually is like, and it was sort of interesting to sort of see that uh, play out on screen. Yeah, well, the, you know, I wanted to show that style of of New Zealand life, and like, you know, and especially in the eighties, it was it was a lot different um, to now. But you know, when when um, <laughs> but you know, that's when I grew up. You know, I was like a kid in the eighties, and like, I grew up in the country, and um, I found that 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 way of that upbringing was really special well I, I wondered about that while i was watching the film in terms of like how much of this is actually like you know autobiographical or anything well not much i mean it's it's more the setting and the place and the time that's autobiographical the whole story is made up but, but it was like, just like you know like the authenticity really is in like how they dress and like what we were listening to and well, like that, the so, kids like, all looking after each other you act in this film so i mean clearly mm. you'd sort of I mean, you'd acted, but you were more, I seemed, focused on writing and directing. 
And you play a significant role. You play the father of Boy um, in the movie. And <laughs> your character's obsessed with E.T., which I thought was awesome. And so yeah. were, were those the things, you know, that stood out the most to you growing up? Were E.T., Michael Jackson, throw? Yeah, up? all of those. Yeah, huge. I mean, for the movie-wise, you know, it's, we had so much, like, so many movies and so much TV flooding into our lives from here so you know we grew up with like tv shows like we grew up with you know incredible hulk um six million dollar man um chips dynasty dallas i mean all of them you know all of those shows um benson is one i'll keep mentioning because I, I think it's just such a ridiculous um idea for a show but um yeah so like it was things like that and then movie wise obviously all of the big 80s films, like all the John Hughes films, we had, um, you know, uh, all the Spielberg films and the Lucas films. And so, you know, whatever you guys watched here, we've seen. That's really interesting to think about, especially from a time, you know, before the internet, because now yeah. everything. I mean, is it was everywhere. obviously like four, five months later, but you know, that we saw that pretty, stuff. But it's pretty, it's, like, it's pretty remarkable still, because, I mean, I. I've never been to New Zealand, and I would aspire to go there at some point. But it feels so remote to me that it's sort of—I wouldn't even think about movie studios being like, "Let's let's take that film to New Zealand." That's like, I know, I know, and I don't know like if they even made money out there, but people would flood to the movies. That's fantastic. I mean, I, and when Ghostbusters opened, um, I was there like on one of the first screenings of Ghostbusters, and the entire audience was singing the song at the beginning wow. of the movie. Because we'd heard the song on the radio a lot, and I don't know if you remember in the beginning of the movie, like the music starts up and it's the and it's a theme song, and everybody just everyone's singing the entire song. It's amazing, That's fantastic. And so, what was the, was the experience like, you know, in terms of acting and directing this film? I, I mean, I had heard stuff or I read stuff online, if you will, that you replaced the lead actor, the the guy who played Boy, was it uh, his name. Uh, James Rolston? Rolston, Rolston yeah. Um, like three days or something before the film was set to be filmed? And yeah, yeah, yeah. He was my Michael J. Fox to um, <laughs> the the Eric Stoltz. Um, no, so he... Uh, we had this other kid who was really, a really great actor and he was perfect, but I'd, I'd cast him about nine months before we were sch scheduled, to, scheduled, scheduled to shoot and... He, by the time we start, you know, we're getting into pre-production and rehearsals, he turned up and he just sort of hit adolescence and he was, mm. he changed, you know, so he like just had a growth spur and he was as tall as me and his moustache was as big as mine and he was like, you know, he's, like, his voice was going and it sort of felt just like so different to what I imagined the character was like, you know, the character's supposed to be like innocent and kind of naive but like very open and like uh, curious about the world and this kid was like just... You know, he he he, he kind of knew the world now. And, yeah. And when you're trying to get kids to be themselves, you know, and try not to act, but actually just be who you are and say the lines, I didn't want that kid to be who he was. Well, it's also it's funny, you know, that's something that you see having a problem all the time now in terms of like, you know, Harry Potter. There was a lot of concern about those kids aging during the movies. Oh, yeah. I think the worst the worst example for me was uh, I don't know if you ever saw the show Lost. The character of Walt, the young kid on that show, they had to write off because he basically went from like a small fry to like yeah. this like six foot tall guy within one year, and it's sort of like the time period on the show was like days, so they yeah, couldn't yeah. explain it, and they just had to write him off. And that's that's really interesting to sort of have to deal with that challenge right before you're supposed to film. And it's also interesting that you you decided to have a significant role in this movie. That seems like a pretty big challenge, especially you know in an indie film where. It's probably a very small crew that you have to manage for a production like that. How much of a challenge was that to sort of, you know, deal with your part on screen versus, you know, directing everyone else, directing inexperienced actors like mm -hmm. James Rolston um, in the film? It seems like you have to have a lot of balls you're juggling there. Sorry. I love juggling balls. <laughs> um, I... Um... Uh, yeah, I was never supposed to play that role. I was auditioning other people, and then I, um, I'm sitting like a real filmmaker. I'm like, ah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's normally Hollywood normal moment. Person. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't supposed to play that role. I was, um, I was auditioning a lot of other people, and but what I wanted from the role was something that was different to how Maori are portrayed normally on screen, and a lot of our actors are kind of. 
I don't want to say limited, but um, limited mm. in terms of like what yeah, like what they're able to achieve sure. because the only roles we ever get offered are you know like the sort of um, you know crazed maniacs who are, like <laughs> killing people or the um, yeah who are really big and gigantic and muscly or like the um, really big and gigantic muscly warrior type stoic mm. spiritual person. So and this guy is like basically a loser who's trying to be tough but uh, is kind of you know weak and kind of skinny and you know and he's yeah he's he's a bit of a loser and you know there are loser maori there are losers in every culture sure, so it's like course, you know, yeah, so it's so and i felt like i'm i matched that character type so well <laughs> that um <laughs> it just made sense for me to play it and also the dad needs to be incredibly good looking so of course yeah naturally it just think. yeah it just made perfect sense one of the things that I liked about the movie is that it was a dramatic departure from, you know, the Flight of the Concords style of sort of quirky comedy. And it was a really kind of earnest movie, if you ask me. It's sort of that, if if I were to describe it to someone else, is that moment where, you know, you I'd realize like to... your, your parents are flawed. Like, yeah. Boy starts out the movie absolutely adoring his father. He wants to go everywhere with him. And there's that moment where, you know, he realizes that his father is just kind of a fuck up, like... Mm -hmm. everyone else i mean it's it's what yeah nobody's perfect and yeah it's about the you know the heroes that you have in your life and how they you know how they disappoint you or how they, how they let you down or how they don't let you down and you know the expectations of these people that, that you put on the, these people the letting them and, down it's the sort of the the come the realization that everyone is flawed and nobody is perfect like these ideals or idols that we have aren't yeah. necessarily accurate and none of them are. and what's uh, i guess interesting is because it's set in the 80s when michael jackson was such a huge mm. huge hero to everyone and then you know a few years later it was you know it was everyone kind of realizing oh that hero is also very flawed you know and it, well it's, it's sort of interesting to think about your character too because not only is he flawed but there's a certain like arrested development to him mm. he's almost like a kid in and of himself yeah, he's a boy. i mean you're you're Boy sort of tells all these stories about him, you know, like he was in the war and he was blah, blah, blah. And there's the scene in the school where the kids are talking and they're like, oh, no, he's, he's in jail with my father. And it's sort of this uh, sort of self-induced um, delusion just because he doesn't want to, like, accept that that's really who his father is. And then when his father comes back, he's like, this guy who has these friends are completely screwed up as well. He's obsessed with E.T. Like, what is it like to sort of, you know, ex sort of display that experience of, like, coming to understand that your father is just a human? Like, what was that like to try and write as a It was a very important, a important part of the story I was trying to tell because... You know, like I, I feel like I'm fascinated by f by families and like the stories that you know get told within families and and the and the family dynamic. You know, the idea that you know you spend your lives with these people and you're supposed to be very close to them, but then at some point, you know, you start realizing, wow, I actually know nothing about these people. You know, I've got close friends who I know way more about <laughs> than you know, than the uh -huh, closest members totally, of my family. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you've got people who you're like. You start realizing the actual the distances between people within your family are actually quite vast, and and I find that fascinating. That's a lot of eagle versus shark deals with that as well. Mm. It's like that, you know, people that, and also yeah, and again like the expectations of you know trying to trying to be loved and trying to be accepted and trying to yeah, you know, and and how people replace things that are lost like an eagle versus shark you know everyone's trying to like deal with the loss of the brother and in this film everyone's trying to deal with the loss of this mother um and yeah and and, and i mean alamein i mean that character he you know he's he's trying to remove himself from you know from that situation to the extent that you know he does um yeah, you know, he changes his name and he changes the way he looks and he tries to you know, start yeah. a gang and he's replacing his wife with this like gang and he's replacing his kids with these like yeah you know, these two losers that he hangs out with and well, like essentially you know, kids as well like, yeah, yeah exactly yeah and so and you know I mean the whole film deals with fantasies and you know, and you know and so like Rocky the littlest brother you know who's um, 
trying to deal with this guilt that he feels over the mother's death and right, like yeah, yeah. You know, he's almost like replacing himself with this monster kind of thing that has powers that he can't control you know and then like boy is trying to replace the mother with the father who he's never actually even met but he's right. like talks about as if you know they've, they used to hang out and now he's the greatest which, which is interesting you know. when they find where he pulls up you, you pull up in the car and you're like hey and he's like are you my dad <laughs> yeah yeah, like, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> he's like oh look it's our dad um, yeah yeah and then yeah, and, and Alamein is trying to replace himself, right, really. Yeah, he's trying to, like, get rid of whatever that that thing was that, you know, that wasn't there when, you know, when when that, that loss happened and was never there for the kids and trying to make himself. Because also adults are just kind of weird around mm-hmm. kids, you know, like, mm-hmm. especially this guy, you know, he's, he's someone who... He feels the need to compete with the kids. I mean, he talks about seeing E.T., you know, All and he's time, like... Yeah. I've seen ET. It keeps talking about like <laughs> I've seen ET like ten times and yeah. stuff. You know, which is what we used to do when we were kids. Was like who had seen the movie first? Other, you know, yeah. it's yeah. like I, I saw uh, Return of the Jedi first. I was one. Of, I was at the first screening. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then people are like, wow, man, you got something, got something over someone else. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things about this project that I didn't realize until recently was that you actually put together a Kickstarter to fund the American tour. I know I had screened yeah. at SIF last year, and I kind of wondered about it, but. It's 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 kind of amazing that you actually put together a, a tour for the film and used used Kickstarter successfully to do that. How did that all? Yeah, come I'm out? amazed that that worked as well. Um, well, I mean, Kickstarter is just incredible. I think it's like one of the most amazing um, new like web inventions, and you know, I think it's totally yeah. Like yeah, there's some such great projects on there. Um, and what's really cool about it is it's putting the you know the power back into the hands of the people who are making the stuff, and you know into the hands of people who, you know. So I think people are becoming more and more savvy these days. We realizing, well, I don't actually need these people to represent me, mm-hmm. and I don't need these middlemen to like you know find me the money, and I don't yeah. need this. People are starting to realize, oh, in the old days when you know we didn't know any rich people. We would have to ask someone who knew a rich person to ask that rich person for money. Oh, yeah. And then they would all take cuts and then you would kind of get to make your thing. That's funny. Um, but now, like, you know, a lot of those people are being cut out because you can go straight to the audience and say, do you want to see this? Mm. And the audience says yes by giving, like, you know, $5, $10, That's $50. Awesome. So, so, yeah, so we're self-distributing the film. And, you know, we had enough money to release in New York and L.A. and, like, two or three other places but to really spread the film and you know that's where you try to you try to hit like a a tipping point where you get to enough places that enough word of mouth happens that enough people like decide they want to see the film and that's what we needed that hundred grand to do is like to get it into the smaller places and you know to take it to places like austin and to um phoenix and you know and philly and chicago and and yeah so so that's really where that came from that's cool. Um, where can people find out more information about you, and what do you have coming up that people might want to check out? Okay, so more information about me is probably Google. <laughs> I don't no, have no a site. Twitter or anything? Oh, I'm on Twitter, yeah, just Taika Waititi, T-A-I-K-A-W-A-I-T-I-T-I, with the at sign in the I'll, front. I'll put it all right down here. Oh, awesome, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then, I mean, boy – boythefilm.com is the site the American site and boy the movie on Facebook and current projects well actually Jermaine and I are, um, uh, have just finished a script that we're going to try and shoot later in the year which is a comedy um, about New Zealand vampires and I know you uh, supposedly directed the pilot of the Inbetweeners oh yeah uh, and I did half the series as well which we've shot the and I think that's remake. coming it's coming out and you Actually, were, I have no idea when that's coming up. <laughs> I think it's sometime this year. Yeah. Um, and you were in Green Lantern, which uh, is probably yeah, yeah. like quadruple so your weird. box office total. <laughs> totally, but, yeah. <laughs> but that was awesome. So um, good luck, uh, Taika, cool. and uh, look forward to seeing what you do next. Cheers. Thank you. And Thanks, you can man. find more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the sun stars. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.